Hey, welcome. Today we're going to be talking through indefinite integrals, what you need to essentially know about indefinite integrals in terms of what they are and what they are used for, specifically for an AP Physics class. So AP Physics C, Mechanics, or Electricity and Magnetism, depending on if you're in one or both of those courses. And I'm going to assume that you may have had some physics before or you may not have had physics before. Either way is going to be totally fine. So let's go ahead and get to it. First of all, I do want to talk about applications of this, like what integrals are used for with a very simple example. In fact, this is about as simple of an example as you can possibly have. And to do so, I need to talk about a concept that's in physics called work. Work is important because it bridges forces and energy. And it turns out that work is equal to the force parallel to motion times the distance through which that force is applied. And here I've drawn a very simplified free body diagram. In fact, not every force is on this free body diagram in case this is your introduction to physics. So I'm making this as simple as possible as an example problem. And we're just focused on that force applied that's moving in the x-axis and the distance through which that force is applied. If that's the case, we can just simply multiply those two numbers together and solve for work. Well, what if we made a very simple graph based on some data, let's say, and we figured out what that constant force was and we were able to plot it on our graph, like right here, and we measured the distance through which that force is applied. And the question becomes, what is work on this graph. So how is work represented on this graph, so to speak? Like, where is the work here? What do you think? Well, hopefully you get the idea that just as any rectangle would be like, say, length times width is the area of a rectangle, you could say the area of this rectangle right here is also equal to the work, so to speak. So it turns out that this area right here, this area of this rectangle equals the work, so to speak. And that's an important concept because we can do similar things with similar scenarios. So let's go ahead and give that a try. If we had a more complex scenario like we have right here, the principle would still be the same. You just would have to have slightly different means of calculating what the area is. So if you take a look at this, obviously the area of a triangle would be one half base times height, and the area of the rectangle would be base times height or length times width. And the question becomes, well, what would be the area here? What would be the work for this scenario? If we had, let's say, the data for this distance, this distance, and this force right here, what would be the area bounded by this line right here and going over here between that and the x-axis line that I'm going to label over here. So hopefully you can see that you would take the area of the triangle and you would add it to the area of the rectangle. And that would be equal to the work. So that's an alternative way of thinking about how to solve for the work. All right, well, let's take that idea and make it even more complex. So let's say, for instance, that we don't have regular objects here, but we want to solve for the work where we have this line right here. It's just some function that I've drawn over here, and I'm going to badly draw a line on top of it. Ooh, that was not so good. In any case, if we thought about what would be the work here, well, hopefully it would make sense to say if we solved for this area, now you may object and say, I have no idea how to do that. That's okay. But if we were able to solve for the area under the curve, so to speak. So that's an important phrase. I'm going to write that down because you'll hear that a lot in calculus or in physics, talking about the area under the curve. Even if something is not really a curve, like I will show you an example in just a moment, you still are looking at the area between the function, the line right here that we have, and the middle axis line, like say the x-axis line right there. So that area is still important to find out. Now you may be saying, well, that's all fine and good, but we don't know how to solve for that. And the answer to that objection is that's the purpose of today. The purpose of today's lesson is to figure out skills, mathematical skills, to be able to solve for this area under the curve. Why? Well, because sometimes forces are not nice and neat forces that are constant. In other words, 
If you were to plot the force over a certain distance over here, it's very rare that you're going to actually have a constant force. Now, all of regular physics is based off of the assumption that you're dealing with a constant force, and it is true that a lot of times an average or a constant force will do just fine for calculations. But it's also true that that is not always the case. What do I mean? Well, think about just a simple example of someone hitting a baseball with a baseball bat. It turns out that if we were to plot the force, it would be more like this example up top than this example down below. We're saying that reality is a little bit more complex. And with that added complexity, if we can model reality more correctly, then we can better understand nature and reality and better predict what can happen based off of calculations. All right, there is one more concept that you need to talk about before I show you a more complex situation. And that is if we were going to sum up the work or solve for the area of these values, what you would do here is you would say the area here would be treated as positive, this being treated as negative. In other words, if we were looking at this system and saying, what is the total work that this certain force is doing on the system? Well, you would have to total up the positive and the negative values. So let's say this area over here is equal to 60 joules. And let's say this area over here is equal to 10 joules. All you would do is you would say the work that's done by the system or on the system would be equal to 60 joules plus a negative 10 joules for a work of 50 joules. So if you're talking about an area below the x-axis, what you're going to do is treat that as a negative value. All right. Well, hopefully now, I believe now you understand enough to be able to take a look at a more complex diagram that's actually going to combine a lot of what we've been talking about so far. So you can see you do have the positive and negative values for the areas under the curve, so to speak. And I do want to clarify again, under the curve right here this is an area under the curve let me get a different color so you can more easily see that this is an area under the curve this is an area under the curve this is an area under the curve so under the curve literally means between the function line this f of x line right here and the middle axis line is the area that we are considering and as long as you consider above the middle axis is positive below the middle axis is negative you can come up with the sum of that value. Now, that graphically is what an integral is. An integral is the area under the curve for some function. And now you can understand that it's actually useful for a lot of things in physics because we don't always have constant forces and constant things to work with. We actually have to work with more messy situations because life is messy. All right, and the next thing I want to talk about here is approximating this area and starting to think about how would you go about calculating this area. Well, one way to do it would be as if you drew a bunch of rectangles. And if you added up the sum of all of the areas of these rectangles, you would get an approximation for the area under the curve. Now, if you tried this, you would quickly realize the more rectangles you have and the smaller the width of those rectangles in the x-axis, the closer the approximation is going to be to actual reality. There is a concept in math that we can use here. We can say if the x-axis value is a limit as you approach zero, meaning basically the distance in width from one rectangle to the next approaches zero, then you can basically get the area under the curve for a curved shape. And that's what we're going to be doing effectively is calculating the area under the curve. And I'm going to show you how to do that next. All right, so how do we go about calculating the area under a curve? Well, first, I need to remind you of what we mean by a derivative over here so we can work with that because these are basically inverse of each other. They are more or less the opposites operation. If a derivative is wrapping a presence, then an integral would be unwrapping a presence, so to speak. So derivative, what you're going to do, d dx of xn, this is going to be your n value will be your power over here. Essentially what you do is you subtract one from n over here, and then you draw one n out in front as a coefficient to multiply by the 
x or whatever your variable is here. So for an example, the derivative of x to the fifth would be 5 times x to the fourth. All right, well, we've gone over that, and I'll put a link up in the upper right for some other lessons. But for now, we can say if we're going to take the integral of a polynomial, what we want to do is the opposite. Now, before I even continue, I want to demystify some of this stuff. This symbol right here just means sum like the sum of all these little rectangles that we're envisioning as a limit as you approach zero for their width. So meaning they're infinitesimally small in terms of their width, and you have a very good approximation of what their values are. This dx over here tells you in relationship to what variable you are integrating, so in relationship to x. And that effectively goes away after you take the integral. So this is essentially taking the integral, this equal sign over here, and what are we left with? Well, we take x to the power of n plus 1. Whatever n was previously, instead of subtracting 1, you're going to add 1. And instead of multiplying by n, you're going to divide by n plus 1. So if you take a look at the example down below, the integral of x to the fifth with respect to x is equal to x to the sixth over 6 plus c, plus this c right here. This c stands for a constant. It's just a constant that is kind of like a variable in the sense that it could be just about any number. And you could say, well, why is that? Why is there a constant there? And one way to think about this is if we took the derivative of x squared, that would be 2x. Well, what if we took the derivative of x squared plus 5? That would still give us 2x. So even if we just add some number, almost like a variable, but just any number, you're still going to get the same answer as you had previously, still the same answer. So when we do the opposite operation, we need to acknowledge that fact and say the integral of 2 to the x with respect to x is equal to x squared plus some constant. Now this could be 0 right here, but it could be like 5 or 2 or just about any real number, and that's something to be aware of as well. All right, lastly, I do want to go through some examples here so you can understand what's happening. So if we were to take the integral of x to the negative 3, we're going to add 1 essentially to this number right here. So that becomes x to the negative 2 divided by negative 2 plus c. Or we can simplify this. We could say negative 1 over 2 to the x squared. That would be another way of writing something else. Oh, and I need to write my plus c. It can be kind of easy to forget your plus c. Try to get in the habit of remembering. And I need to remind myself to do the same. If I label this as like 1, 2, 3, and 4, if we look at problem number 2, here what you're going to want to do is change the power that's in the denominator into a negative power. And so what does that mean? You could say, well, that would be equal to the integral of x to the negative 2, because that's effectively what that negative sign means when it comes to powers. And we say with respect to x, then we would say, well, what is that? So negative 2 plus 1 would be a negative 1. So that would be x to the negative 1 divided by negative 1 plus c. Or you could simplify this or sort of change the format if you wanted to. 1 over negative x plus c. That would be another way of writing the same thing. All right. Well, there are trig functions that get involved with calculus as well. So one other example that we need to take a look at is number 3 over here. So it turns out that if you take the integral of something to the negative power, what you're going to be doing is just essentially writing the natural log of the absolute value of that function plus c. So this is something that is on your equation sheet, but you do need to become exposed to it early on and be reminded of that fact from time to time. So if we take a little slightly more difficult problem in number four, you can draw out the one fourth like we would with a derivative over here as a constant that just gets multiplied out. And then you're left with the integral of one over x with respect to x. And I want you to think back to example three and you would say, well, I know that I can say one fourth times the natural log of the absolute value of that function is my answer plus c. So that's how you would do some intro problems with indefinite integrals. Hopefully this has been helpful. I'm trying to give lessons for all of the major ideas in physics and AP physics and trying to give you the foundation for what you need to know 
in five lessons. Hopefully I'll be able to do it in five lessons when it comes to some of the key calculus ideas you need to know for AP Physics C. Take care.